Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. We've been having a conference all weekend called No Beyond, and we've been learning about the Muslim faith and how to love and reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the very things that God is doing in our world right now. And so we have seen the, just so many beautiful things during this conference. He's drawing them to himself by the droves. And I just wanted to take this time to, to thank you all for coming and being a part of that conference. And I just wanted to uh, thank my dear brother who labored so hard to put that together. And so we thank you, uh, Pastor Andreos, for all that you did uh, for that conference. Well, this morning we're going to finish up and we'll do so by looking at one of the most important sections of Scripture on the church's mandate of what we are to be doing now as the bride of Christ while we wait the imminent return of Jesus Christ that we, we long and we urge and we hasten that today would be the day come, Lord Jesus. But in that time, we have power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 1 this morning. If you will turn there. Uh, I'm going to read Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 8, and then we will go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Verse 1, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive. After his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God, and gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now." And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time then that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. This is the word of God. Let us go before him and pray. Father, we thank you that you have inspired this word. I thank you that what we open up this morning is the very word of God. And so I pray that there is a reverence to every heart here in this room that we now study and look at the words of God. I thank you that you've inspired them, but you also illumine them by your spirit. And I pray this morning that your spirit would illumine every mind and heart. God, that we would understand this commission, that our hearts would be stirred by truth and that we would desire to to obey this very commission. Lord, that we would be witnesses to the ends of this earth. And so, Lord, let no one think this is for someone else. Let every believing heart in this room receive their mandate from the living God. And I pray that your spirit would do what no man could do this morning. And we ask that you would move in power among us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The book of Acts was written by the beloved physician Luke. And in verse 1, we're told that Theophilus, he wrote it to him. Uh, This is the first account, he says, is what we know then as the gospel of Luke. And it says it's all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so what Jesus began to do was a record in the gospel of Luke of his miracles and his power over the world and the elements and the disease and the spiritual world. He came in and he showed and manifested that he was indeed God. All of that proved that in Romans 1, it was declared in power by his resurrection that he was indeed the Son of God. So he came and he did that. Luke recorded it. And all that he began to teach And so Jesus came into this world, fully God, fully man, and he proclaimed the kingdom of God. He proclaimed that he is the king of the kingdom that he is inaugurating. He came and he explained his kingdom. He told us how to enter, how to enter at the narrow gate into this kingdom that he is now establishing. I am the door, I am the way, I am the way into the kingdom. And in in Matthew 5 through 7, we spent a year as a church looking at the Sermon on the Mount of how do kingdom citizens live? 
We live like no other on the face of the earth. And so we have the gospel of Luke showing us these things. And now this morning we're beginning to look at this first section of Acts, which would be part two then in the series that Luke wrote. Part one was Jesus' life on this earth. God came into this world to bring salvation. Part two is Jesus' life now from heaven and how he works now for this global salvation from heaven instead of his physical presence here upon the earth. And so we will see this morning that he does so by the presence of his Holy Spirit indwelling believers. He now acts from heaven by his spirit indwelling millions and millions of believers around this globe. So Jesus is no longer present physically, but he has poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost in the next chapter in Acts 2. And he is present now through his body of Christ for those who are indwelt by the spirit of God proclaiming the kingdom of God and doing the acts that show forth the kingdom of God. Transformed lives. We saw last week the life of an agape love to God and love to others. We now go show the power of God through transformed lives who have beheld the living Christ. So we have his message and we have his power changing our lives as we engage this world with the name that is above every other name, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus has now ascended into heaven. And then he wants us to continue then what he started. He did inaugurate the kingdom of God. The king is now on his throne and his kingdom is advancing. Salvation and a new citizenship called heaven and we call it the church of God, the church victorious. And so the mission that we have been taken up into by the means of a new birth, We have been born again, and we have been born into this family, into this mission, into this kingdom. And here in Acts 1, then, we have the finishing of Jesus' earthly ministry, the beginning of his heavenly ministry, the universal gospel now going universal in Acts. It's going to go to the ends of the earth, and we have it recorded by Luke for us in Acts That which was a a come and see religion, come to Jerusalem. Remember Solomon when the queen said, I heard all of these great things, but it's even more than I heard. This is no longer a come and see religion. It's a go and tell religion. Now go take this to the nations. Go proclaim it, share it. This is such an amazing time that we live in the history then of God's redemption. Jesus is done with his work here on this earth. He finished it with tetelestai, It is finished. I have accomplished salvation. But the fruit of his work is now to extend to the nations. His work is now through his spirit indwelling the church of God to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. We are his chosen instruments to accomplish this task. This purpose that the Father would receive glory and honor and praise from all the nations of the earth by the manifestation of his grace through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the free offer of salvation in Jesus Christ alone is how he subdues for his kingdom. Such a beautiful plan, isn't it? We've been called up into this marvelous plan of God. But there's a problem that really needs to be taken care of in Acts chapter 1. The ones that, who were about to lead this great commission, this charge that Jesus has given, is the apostles. And in the Gospel of Luke, they didn't have the best track record of anybody I've ever met. At face value, it kind of seems like a bad idea. That just such a massive undertaking that he is now given to those 12 by such a powerless people, seven fishermen who have failed Jesus in many ways during his earthly ministry. When, when Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified, every time in Mark, they would argue over who would be the greatest in the very next context. How many times do we say, oh, ye of little faith, stay awake and pray, and the first thing they do is fall asleep. When Jesus was arrested, they fled. Peter denied him three times. I swear I don't even know the man. This is not the raw material for such a task. And as I look out here this morning and look at myself, I don't feel much more confident. There are just not many wise, mighty, or noble among us. We are a motley crew that God has called out 
from this earth. And so something has to happen if we're to pull off a commission like this. They needed something really bad, and so do we this morning. And it was something that Jesus had and modeled while he walked this earth. Jesus was the prototypical one of this great commission that we have received. Luke tells us that his whole ministry was done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was in submission to the Holy Spirit all of his days upon this earth. He was dependent, working through the Holy Spirit. He, he, it's, Luke said he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. He modeled to us what this would look like. We have the exact same spirit that dwelt among the incarnate Son of God. And so we have received that spirit to go now and, and to live the life that Jesus Christ lived through the same power that Jesus Christ lived through. And so what we need for this task is very simple. We need the power of God. What we have been learning all weekend and our, all of our lives, if we are going to do this task, I need the power of God or it fails. It will not happen without that. And so the Holy Spirit of God indwelling them and empowering them for this great task. You take away the Holy Spirit and you get much of what we see in the world today. And sadly, many of our own lives. You, you get church where people play and they come and they do all the external things and there's literally no power for what Jesus is calling us to do here in this commission. You get people who really only care about their own lives. That's all I care about is my own life. This, this gospel is I got saved, I get to go to heaven at the end and that's all I care about. You have missed the whole program of what you have been saved into. All I worry about is my own comforts. All I want is to get to heaven at the end. You get a lot of what we read about with the 12. I won't believe unless I put my fingers in the holes. So guys, we need power from on high to do this. Not a bunch of whip, whipped up people. Not just getting people emotionally stirred up. That will accomplish nothing. I've seen it through my whole life. Jesus' plan is so beautiful for how to take a universal gospel now universal. It is absolutely beautiful, the design of God. That he would never forget the most important component to this actually being realized is that it would be worked out and done through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so my question this morning, and it's for all of us, those who want to give their lives to the commission by our King, those at this conference who want to see Muslims come to Jesus Christ, those who want to see the Chinese and the Russians and Mexicans and Americans and Europeans and people from India and the islands and your neighbors and your own children that just want to see people brought to Jesus Christ. How do we do it? Well, what did Jesus' first apostles need then to change the world? That's what I want to look at this morning. To, to be witnesses and to declare Jesus Christ. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. First, what we need, the first account, he says, in verse 1, I composed Theophilus about all that I began, that Jesus began to do and teach. And so this is where the gospel begins. This is where the power starts. This is what Jesus did. This is what he taught about the kingdom of God. This is how you enter, is through him and through him alone. It's, it's a bloody door. It's a crucified door. It's a perfect righteousness door that you get from Jesus to enter into this kingdom. There, there, there's a righteousness that has to be perfect to enter into the kingdom of God. Would you die this morning to any hope of your own righteousness of getting through that door? It's been proclaimed and preached. It, it's perfect righteousness to get in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus Christ came into this world and he gave us a perfect righteousness. And God's the gospel is I will wrap you in that garment of righteousness. And so I pray that every sinner here, every one of you have been stripped of your own righteousness. You've got to repent of your sin to be saved and you've got to repent of your righteousness. And I pray that you'll look at your own righteousness and see it as a filthy rag and repent so that you can enter in to the kingdom of God. To look at the one where Luke finished his gospel hanging on a cross, dropping his head, saying, it's finished. Into thy spirit, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And they buried him 
and then they come early that Sunday morning, and he's not there, he's risen just as he said. And now in our text this morning, he, he ascends into complete victory, seated at the right hand of God, to now begin this commission that we have. This has taken up the heart, this has to take up the hearts of the church again. For the month, month of October as a church, we're celebrating the five solas of the Reformation, and it's been 500 years since Luther nailed that thesis up on the wall. And it was a, a time in history to recover the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was recovered, and it was like wildfire as it began to spread through the regions. And so we have to get the gospel right. We have to have tasted it for ourselves. We don't need people who understand this academically going out to be witnesses. We need people who have tasted this and seen the glory of God and lives have been changed. We have to get the gospel right before we go to this next step. And you need a, a Wesley where it's even my sins have been forgiven. I don't care that you say Jesus forgives sins. Even my sins, have you been brought to that place where even my sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ? That is our first step before we will ever be effective in taking the gospel to the nations. Have I taken it to my own heart? Have I seen what Jesus said and did? Have I believed it? Have I come to that place of saving faith? That will be the first step in the book of Acts. Secondly, if we are ever going to be faithful to this task, we need a, a confidence uh, not cowardice. Uh, Rodney talked about that this morning. What, did character, what characterized these early apostles is, is, is fear, that they're hiding, they're afraid, they're next, they're going to be crucified, so they're hiding away in rooms, they're running, they're afraid for their very lives now. In verses 2 and 3, until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive. And after his suffering, the crucifixion, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God, he has come, he has shown them, he's alive. I'm no longer dead. I've been risen. I am the one who conquered death. I'm, I'm, I'm alive. I've conquered it. It can't hold me. Death couldn't keep me. Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen is more than something we yell out on sun, Easter Sunday. He's risen, absolutely, and, and they saw it, they believed it, and that brought them out of cowardice. That brought them out to start engaging this world that would persecute and kill every one of them. In Acts 2, at Pentecost, the Spirit is poured out, and now there's a courage, and Peter, cowering Peter, now stands, and he proclaims that Jesus Christ is the one that all the scriptures have pointed to, and he is the one. There's salvation in no other name, and he did not care about any threat or any persecution. And as you keep following through Acts, you see that this is real, and, and you now understand the plan of Jesus Christ. And the cowardice goes away when you see that he's risen. And they showed that, and the apostles now are ready to go give their lives for the name that's above every name. Cowardice flees when you see a risen Christ. Thirdly, what we need. We need to understand the task. <clears throat> In verse six, is, 6 through 8, when they come together, they're asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time now that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he, and he said, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. And so the apostles want to know from Jesus, is it now that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And so this is the promise throughout the Old Testament, the promise of the new covenant that would come, and there would be a, a greater David who would sit on his throne, and there would be no end. The nations would be thrown down, and they had been waiting for this time, the consolation of Israel. And so they want to know, is it now that you are going to bring that about? And Jesus tells them, you cannot know the time. It will come like a thief in the night we see in the Gospel of Luke. There's a doctrine of imminency that the church must live in that every day this could be the day that Jesus Christ returns. And so we see this in many of his parables. Keep working. He'll come when, on a day when you don't expect it. And so the bottom line is saints of God, live as if every day was your last day. Live every day as if Jesus Christ would return this day. Every day, I am working for the kingdom of God, and I am waiting and hastening and urging, Jesus, would you take fast strides? Come back today. 
Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, please let this be the day that you come and make all things right. And the disciples are saying, is it now? And Jesus is saying, you're not going to know these times. Every generation has been called to live in light of this truth. Paul talked about it as if it could happen in his day. And so, guys, the call is to be faithful to this task as if today was the day that Jesus was going to return. And that is what he's going to judge you on, he says, on that last day. Not how much, but have you been faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ that you have received and believed? Are you being faithful to this commission? And so we have to ask ourselves that in light of a coming Christ. I, as a pastor, what I see most often is we're trying to put our tent stakes down in, in Denver. And we're trying to make our lives here where we have no lasting city. And we need to keep seeking the city that is above and hastening and urging the coming of Jesus as we preach this gospel to every soul, anyone that God will bring into our lives. We are unified and one in this gospel. And the reason I picked this passage is our fourth thing then that we need if we are ever going to do this commission, and that's in verse 8. So it's not for you to know the times of the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. In the Greek, this is the strongest adversative that you can use. So instead of knowing all the times, and is this the time that you're going to establish it with Israel, he says, but, but here's what I am doing. What I am doing is you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you on the day of Pentecost, and here's what's going to happen for this epic, this part of God's redemptive history, is you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What you will receive right now in just a few days is the Holy Spirit, apostles. So power will come to you, but not the end time of the consummation of all things, but power to begin the advancement of the kingdom of God that will climax in, uh, in Romans 11 with, with God coming back and all Israel being saved and what he will establish. Power from on high is what he promised for the great ingathering of the nations. And so we live in one of the most amazing times as we live in the time where God is gathering in the nations and he's using us as his instruments full of his Holy Spirit empowered to do what he has asked the church to do. So this is the verse that I really want to look at this morning. This is what I see lacking in the church today and just too much here even at Southside Bible. I want more of this. This is what I think needs our attention. We give a lot of attention to the truth of the message, and I believe that we should. But we need to give attention to the power that God will give to us to take this message that we're trying to understand and love and treasure to anywhere God will give us an open door. So I want you to hear this. We have been given the Spirit of God to do this very thing, he says, to witness to the world. So I want you to not think too small because I, I, the easy thing is to look at my own gifts and say, I'm not good for anything. And in Romans 12, it warns you against thinking too lowly of your gifts and too highly. And I don't want you to just sit here saying, oh, I'm just a nobody. I got nothing I can't offer. Uh, that isn't true. If the Spirit of God is dwelling within you, you have his power for the advancement of the kingdom of God and to be his witnesses. And so we have been learning all, all weekend and I enjoyed the brother who's doing the Syrian refugees uh, Saturday morning when he shared. And he just said that there's no way that God could use someone like me. He's basically saying, my gifts and who I was, this shouldn't, this, don't use me. And here's God using him to transform and change this area and teaching children and women and the gospels going out to these refugees to send them back to Syria one day with the gospel. We learned about a faithful man connecting resources from Boulder all the way to the Springs to work together with college kids in Colorado who are Muslim, who have come from other countries, and how to love and share Jesus Christ with them. We saw this morning some beautiful things with that other brother who has the media and how they're training and equipping people in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I just want you to hear the testimony of every one of those people is there's, there's nothing to me. <laughs> 
But the power of this Holy Spirit is changing and transforming lives and areas and regions that I could never do in my own power. So I want you to hear that. Don't let that go by. If you have the Spirit, and the Bible says every believer does, then we have the power to fulfill this command. We have power from on high to be His witnesses. He is not looking for great earthly giftings. Lose that but he's looking for humble servants filled with the Spirit of God to expand the horizon of God's restoration of a universal fall to a universal call. All peoples for a conquest by the grace of Almighty God in Jesus Christ. And so we have the Spirit to go with the message of the gospel of grace to conquer and take down enemy territory for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so look with me in verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what I want to make sure that you get this morning, he's talking to the 12 apostles, but this is not just for the apostles. Because this is a commission that the Spirit has been given to the church for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. And so that continues to this very day. The Spirit himself desires the nations the elect of God, to come to Jesus Christ from every corner for salvation. The Spirit of God desires that. He's working for that. He is working in every believer this morning to bring that about. And so we have some of us here this morning. (coughs) I've been overwhelmed just looking around. We've got uh, someone from Spain who's a missionary there, North Africa, Kenya, uh, children on the street, uh, Ch- Chinese, there's a, a brother here and, and his wife that they've gone to just some people who have come over from China in college and they've been ministering to them and sharing with them and they had, I think it was five people led to Jesus Christ just recently on a camping trip. And so if, if you want to be a part of that, come see me. And, and there's some who, who shared Christ with a coworker this morning, uh, entrusted word, I can't even count how many nations that training and truth and all the things that uh, John Battenfield is working for, it's unbelievable, all the things that are going on just from this building right now for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's the things that we're looking at. The Spirit was poured out in Acts 2. He is now working even to this day in the body of Christ, universal, to bring the gospel universally to the ends of the earth. And I'm going to say it again and again. We have power to do this from on high. So don't settle for trying this in your own strength, I I beg you. Don't, Don't do that. You can't do anything in your own strength. Be led of the Spirit to give of your time and your talent and your money for this end. As we heard this morning, open up your lives. Be be open and loving. Quit hiding away. Open up. The gospel opens you up. God has an open hand. We have open hands, open hearts. Open yourselves up. Let the Spirit of God move us. Make that your chief end, not the American dream. Make it Jacob's dream. Be be done with looking for making your your paradise here on Denver. You're going to be greatly disappointed if you do. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us to bring this about through little human instruments, clay pots with the glory of God housed inside of them. Don't be afraid. The gospel is he is risen, and you have his Spirit to be witnesses of that very truth. Let that land on your hearts this morning. I've been praying for this. I pray, let it land on your hearts. He's risen, and I have the Spirit of God to testify of the risen one who is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. So you shall be my witnesses. I love the Greek word for witness. The Greek word is martyres. It's where we get the word martyr. A martyr is one who dies for his testimony, one who dies for his witness, So at the time that this command was given to these apostles, the world was completely pagan. There was no cultural Christianity at that point. This message was alien to everything about their culture. God became incarnate. The man Jesus Christ died for sins. He paid a ransom. Believe in him or perish in your sins. That was so alien to that day and time. 
And as a result, the persecution spread like wildfire in the early church. And the word witness became that very thing, martyrs, because these witnesses were being martyred and killed for their faith. All who received this command that day of these apostles, except John, died for their witness. They all became witnesses and they all became martyrs for the name of Jesus Christ. The two became married. I will die for the one who died for me and is risen. Guys, this is happening in our culture today. The more faithful your witness, you're called extreme, intolerant, hate crimes. The world wants you out of it. And so we've lost a cultural Christianity here in America. And for so long, the church was just about that. We were after common grace of how to keep the family right and marriage and morality. I just want a Christian America. I want a moral America where everybody lives morally. The church thought that was their witness, and we gave ourselves to political activism. We're going to legislate and make sure that we hold these great morals and everything works that way. John MacArthur, he said, we have turned the mission field into the enemy. And that is what happened in America is they became our enemy instead of the mission field. What happens when that happens? Christianity became a political movement. I had a guy who left his church and came to visit here, and he said he left because the flag was not properly displayed at his church. Was Christ properly preached at your church? The message Jesus proclaimed The gospel has to be recovered. Hearts need to be taken up with the gospel of grace again. The charge to the church, 500 years later, we need a reformation on justification by faith in Christ alone. We need a gospel that people quit working up their own righteousness to get. They need an alien righteousness from heaven, and we need to start being witnesses of that gospel and that truth. We've got a witness of him. And so I've resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. That was the mantra of the Apostle Paul. I'm done with anything else. I preach Christ and him crucified. Go witness to that. Go tell a world of a Christ who was crucified in their place so they would not bear the wrath of God. Witness that truth. The only question is, are we a faithful witness or an unfaithful witness? And I I hate even wrestling sometimes with that question. Are you a faithful witness? Because what's hurting the church of God more than anything is unfaithful witnesses who are witnessing. And so are you a faithful witness? Does this gospel mean more to you than anything? And are you pursuing after holiness with everything within you? I want to be, I want to walk like Jesus Christ walked on this earth. And that's how I'm going to go be a witness. Are we a faithful witness to the risen one? The kingdom advances one soul at a time by a faithful witness. And the, and the, the, the advancement of the Great Commission is never going to be through hitting the home run balls. You're always going to need faithful witnesses. And that's each one of you individually to go be faithful witnesses with the power of Christ who's overwhelmed you with the gospel of Jesus Christ to go be witnesses. Uh, and we'll look at where here in a second, but there's just no shortcuts. There isn't. And so I want to look at what we are to do with our witness. And I just want to go back to Luke's first account, the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> and I'm going to read you what Luke said in, you know, in Luke and then what he said in Acts. And I just want you to hear these two. This is from Luke 26, 46. And Jesus said to them as he's risen, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. In Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. It's the exact same commission. Give us a picture of what Jesus is telling us. He said, here it is. The goal of the mission is to Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Both accounts. You're to go and you're to be my witnesses, Jesus said. The Holy Spirit's coming. Wait. 
Don't run out without him. Wait. The power is coming. Receive the power then to be my witness to the ends of the earth. And we don't get it through Pentecost. We get it now through believing in Jesus Christ. We are indwelt with the Spirit of God. And so the next thing that happens in both accounts is this. Listen to this. In Luke 24, right after he said that, verse 50, he led them out, the disciples, as far as Bethany. And he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising God. They just couldn't quit praising God for seeing the risen one. And that now he's taken up into heaven in victory. They just, to, to ask you guys to worship should be as natural as a baby grabbing a finger. <laughs> worship a God like this. And then listen to Acts 1, 9 through 11. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven in, in, in glory. This is Jesus' ministry from heaven then mediated by his spirit. We're to be witnesses until he returns. He has been taken up into glory and he's going to ret return in glory. And it'll be the end of the age. There'll be no more witnessing when Jesus Christ comes back. It's, that season is over. But the season that we live in this one life I get before I die is I get to be a witness of Jesus Christ. It's a, such a privilege. Let's, let's take full advantage of this gift that God has given to us. I think it's a gift to be witnesses of the most beautiful thing. I, I know people who will witness for the Broncos. You'll witness for your IRA. There's all these things you'll witness. And I want to ask you, is this, this is the, the center of my heart is all I want to do is be a witness to this one. This one is my witness. Make disciples. What's, uh, to be a follower of Jesus, what's the last thing that Jesus said? Go be witnesses. Do you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ? <laughs> Go be witnesses here and to the ends of the earth. That, that's the last thing he commanded us to do. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but my mouth is shut and I do nothing for the kingdom of God. Can't be. Followers of Jesus Christ, here's your commission. You go be witnesses of the risen Christ. It's interesting in Acts 1.10 that there, all of a sudden, it just seems weird. There's two men who are standing there in white clothing telling them what's going on. And at the crucifixion, there were two men standing there in white clothing saying, he's risen. So the, the witnesses are in the Old Testament there to confirm a fact, two or three witnesses. And so here's these witnesses testifying, he's, he's risen. And he has now gone up and he's going to come back again in glory. And so we are called to be witnesses. Uh, to, to advocate means to make a, create a case for Christianity, to deduce and to make logical inferences, which is what it, there's a great call on the church to teach doctrine and do that. A witness is someone who's been so touched by the reality of the living Jesus Christ, you have no sense of doubt, I know him. I've tasted of him. I have fellowship with him. I abide. I'm like a vine and a branch with him. So you, go. Go witness of the one that you know you've tasted who's changing your life. Be witnesses of the sweet Christ. The world will be reached by witnesses. And we need advocacy. We need teaching. But I want witnesses in the church of God. That's the call. That's the commission. Go be witnesses outside the church. You hardly ever get persecuted inside this church for loving Jesus. You usually get patted on the back. So go out. Go out and be witnesses where they're going to persecute you for this message. Go out and be faithful with that message. So the world is reached by witnesses. And look in verse 8. What is the sphere that we're to go out into? He says, go to Jerusalem. Right there where they're at, so your very place where you abide, all Judea and Samaria, which was the northern and southern kingdom, and so those are the regions around Jerusalem, 
and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so where we're to witness is right where you live, right in your families, right in your neighborhoods, right in your schools, right at work, is, is right there we're to be witnesses of the risen Christ. And then we're to be witnesses to, to the region that we live in. And we're to go out and we're trying through fire to help other churches and minister and send people and all that we can do. We want to just keep going out to our region, United States, and then we want to go to the very ends of the earth. We, we want to witness all the way to the ends of the earth by the grace of God to take the risen one who we have seen and we know and we love, and I just want to lift him up to anyone. I want that all men who call upon him will be saved. So get this. I'm almost done if you're falling asleep. I don't know how you can fall asleep. I was so excited. I just thought my heart was going to burst before I got up here <laughs> after this conference. The promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to finish the great commission to the ends of the earth by the power of God. The promise is until every people group hears the gospel of Jesus. This offer is power, and it is still available to the church today. We have that this morning to join together to spend and be spent for this great commission. And I want us to be done with lesser things. Please, Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. Are you getting this? We, we could spend all of our days arguing doctrine, how to raise kids, and never be about what Jesus Christ has called us to be about. Could it be that we are the ones who have hid our talents in the sand that the Spirit gave to us for this very call and commission? Could we really spend all of our days as a church and miss what we're supposed to be doing and be nice, moral people? That makes me want to vomit. I'd rather die than be a church like that. Some of you are doing an amazing job. I've never seen anything like it. You are living by the power of the Spirit and you're being witnesses, and I'm not talking about how far. I, I, I just, I'm hearing stories of just beautiful witnesses of one person that you meet. And just you're, you're doing a beautiful job of showing something glorious of a Christ who's changing your life. But there's some of you who are sitting on the bench. You're sitting on the bench, and you're always discontent. You always need something new. You're always complaining about what the church is not. You're always frustrated. And I'm telling you, the cure is to be done with lesser things. Give ourselves to this, and you don't have so much time to sit around judging everybody, being upset. <laughs> okay, get over it. Get over it. There, there's something better to look at, to proclaim, and to seek, to advance. Don't make this about you. So which are you this morning? Are you on the bench? Or are you one who's going out there? So my prayer is, Spirit of God, fill us to be your witnesses and not be distracted on building bigger barns. To, to really be focused on this commission that Jesus has given to us and he gave us the power. So we're about to celebrate the 500th year since the Reformation began with Luther's 95 Thesis. The gospel was recovered, and it did. It, it spread like wildfire. I can't wait to see how many people are in glory because of it. I, I believe I will be because of it, how it came to me in the same way. The gospel was recovered. And it's no strange providence to me that as it was recovered, the printing press was discovered. And so the, the truth now is being printed and disseminated all over the world. And so now the gospel's recovered, and, and now God makes it where there's a providence that we can now send it all over the place to disseminate the truth. And then people began witnessing of Christ, and the Spirit blew, and it awakened a whole world to speak about Jesus Christ. And today, much of the world lies in darkness, and the gospel has been lost in so many regions. 
where the fires of Reformation once burned 500 years ago, most of those places are the deadest places on the face of the planet right now. People lie dead in their sins and despairing in a million different ways, even here in America. We have found so many different ways to be despaired and busied and worried. But today, we have the electronic capability to disseminate truth and to be witnesses in amazing ways. We saw it all weekend of how God is winning Muslims to Jesus Christ because now they can hear truth and they can hear things where they're not trapped and just, you know, being legislated how they should think. It's unbelievable what's going on. The church is waking up to this and what will happen here this morning. We're, I think we have, like, all the different listeners in Ghana and different places listening to the Word of God this morning. So we, we need a worldwide reformation again. And we have recovered the gospel in our own hearts. As a shepherd, I'm seeing so many of you lay hold of the gospel, and it's, it's, it's bearing amazing fruit. But we got to keep growing and being witnesses. I think that's God's message to us. We need to give our lives to see it spread from where we live and exist to Denver, to the United States, and to the ends of the earth. And so I pray for this. I, I think we need a wake-up call. We have the power from on high already right now to do this if we're believers. And I just want everyone to wake up. I just saw a face of a man that every Sunday morning goes into a prison and preaches the gospel and begs men to come to Jesus Christ. And I just, as I look out, I love it. I, I just see so many of you who are giving your lives away for this message. And so that's my prayer, is that we're just, these are the first fruits, and that the Spirit would blow and we would see mighty things. I pray for what I heard about this week. I heard about a revival in Ireland. In case you didn't know it, I'm Irish, Ken Murphy. Uh, I love Ireland, so I just, I, I like to learn about Ireland. And there was a revival in 1859. And what happened is the Spirit blew through that whole region by some faithful witnesses. And so people got saved and it started spreading. And throughout that whole region, the Spirit of God moved. And, and in reading about it, they said uh, even the prostitutes were getting saved. And one reporter after the service, he asked a group of prostitutes after the service, he said, why are all of you girls going to church? And they said, well, number one, business fell off because of the revival, praise God. <laughs> but listen to this. Mainly, people on the streets started treating us with the kindness and love and concern, and it melted our hearts, and we wanted to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The world had been exploiting them and buying them, and the church had been spitting on them, calling them sinners. What did they really need? They needed truth and power. And people started getting the gospel of Jesus Christ in Ireland, and the lost didn't have God's law, and the church didn't have God's love. And the Spirit came and blew, and when it fell upon this area, they became witnesses because they had truth and they had love that began to reach out and witness to the whole country of Ireland. When the Spirit fell on this area, they were witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so a revival is when the truth of Jesus Christ is understood, and it becomes a force by the witnesses engaging their world with love and truth. And when we get that, all men will know we're his disciples because we have love for one another. And so in closing, some of you need to come out of covert. Are you a secret disciple? Some of you need to give your life full time to the spread of the gospel. We've heard so many opportunities this weekend. And some of you need to really pray, is God calling me to full time mission work? Is he calling me to sell my business and surrender everything and go and do that, that the power of the witness within me could declare Jesus Christ till I quit breathing on this earth. Some of you need to respond to what the Spirit of God is telling you. Some of you might need a short-term mission trip to go expand your heart and your purpose and see and, and be a part of that. There's nothing like being there and experiencing that. And some need to stop making your life about you. That could be every one of us here this morning. How to spread this gospel by our own witness and to just quit 
planning out my own life and all that matters is that I get to heaven at the end, I, I want you to die to that thinking this morning because it's sin. It really is sin. God has brought you in and he's called you to be a witness to this greater thing. And so I think I want you to, every one of us, to get along with God today and wrestle. God, what do you want? What, what is it in my life? Where am I lost focus of this beautiful thing that Jesus has given to us? The gospel has been dammed up by my selfish ambitions and pursuits. The Spirit has been poured out, and He has taken up residence in our hearts to empower us to be witnesses. And so my charge is, shall we? Shall we be witnesses of the name that's above every name? I just, I, it's like asking you to witness of the, the greatest thing, that, that God is gracious, that God sent his son into a world to die for sinners. Just go be witnesses of that which gave you life, and may God use that to give life to others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this weekend. I thank you for the beautiful things that we have heard of what your spirit does in a witness, what your spirit is do, doing in leading many many, many Muslims to Jesus Christ. God, I pray for the harvest. I pray for more that you would keep gathering more and more. I pray for all the ends of the earth. God, there are so many who need the gospel. They do not have the Bible in their own language and don't even have a witness in their land. God, I pray that you would move in the hearts of every one of us to say, if, if I am called right here, I will use every resource, everything I have to be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. I will help those who are called to other lands to be a faithful witness. I will do whatever it takes. God, help us to not lose sight of this beauty of what you've called us to be. Thank you for how many in this church labor day and night for that purpose. Lord, it blesses my heart, and you are spreading your name and lifting it up all over the world. And I just pray for, for those who um, have lost their way those who this American dream and all of its lies have been choking out the truth. They're very much the thorns, and we're choking this morning. We're being deceived by the deceitfulness of riches and the worries of this life. God, I pray for repentance for those souls here this morning. God, help them to be done with lesser things. Lord, set them free. Your gospel is a message of freedom. God, let them know the truth, and the truth will set them free. God, release them. From that bondage, I pray this morning. And I pray for those who are under the bondage of sin. No matter how much they try to clean themselves up, they continue to fail. No matter how much they try to patch up their own righteousness, when it stands before perfect, holy righteousness, it will melt away. God, let them flee to Christ for the righteous garment that can make them stand in your presence blameless with great joy. Oh God, let any in this room who do not know Jesus Christ that even now, Lord, they would call upon him to be saved, or that they would confess Jesus Christ as their Lord this morning. Lord, I pray uh, for those in our midst that need you. God, thank you uh, for this whole weekend. We just want to give you all the glory and praise and honor. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.